Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns Podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. I'm John Simmerman, founder of the Active Towns Initiative and your host on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. In this episode, you'll meet Pam LeBlanc, a freelance writer based right here in Austin, Texas, who travels near and far looking for exciting adventures to share with us all. She's also recently published her first book. We talk about that and some of her more memorable experiences in just a moment. But before we dive into that discussion, I must mention that this episode is being brought to you by the generous support of our donors and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. Thank you all so very much for your amazing support. I always say no contribution amount is too small because every little bit adds up. To learn how you too can make a huge difference in helping me to produce this content, please head over to activetowns.org and click on the donate link in the top right corner of the page. Also for your convenience, I've included the appropriate links in the show notes. Oh, and one last thing before we get started. If you're enjoying the Active Towns podcast, please subscribe to and rate it on your preferred podcatcher platform, including our new YouTube channel. Okay, time to jump into this adventure with Pam LeBlanc. This is John with the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm absolutely delighted to have online with me Pamela Pam LeBlanc. (laughs) Pam, it's so wonderful to connect with you here today. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much, John, and thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here talking with you. First off, I want to thank you for taking time to chat with me because you are an incredibly busy person <laughs> and it took us a little <laughs> while to actually get this scheduled. Uh, perhaps it makes sense for, for us to just have you share with the listeners uh, a little bit of your background, a little bit about yourself and how you came to be as, you know, Pam, the, the adventurer and it become almost a part of your persona. Yeah, I'm not really sure how that happened. I grew up in Austin and I went into journalism, worked for a couple of small newspapers and came back to my hometown to work for the Austin American Statesman in 1998. Um, And they had me out in a bureau covering kind of uh, boring stuff to me, not boring, but city council, school board, things that weren't really my personality. Um, they eventually moved me downtown into the features department, and I and I was a general assignment feature writer. So I got to write about kind of whatever I wanted. And my lifestyle has always been outdoors and active. I've always, or for years, I have ridden my bike to work at the Statesman. I I'm a swimmer. That's kind of my I call it my alpha sport. That's what I do. I love to be in the water, whether it's water skiing, swimming, you know, scuba diving, anything. Uh, paddling, whitewater rafting. Um, so it was my lifestyle and it was what I liked to write about. So gradually I kind of shifted to writing about that. And someone suggested at the Statesman that I write a column about fitness and outdoor activity. And I started that maybe 15 years ago and away we went. So I have been writing about outdoor adventure now for 15 or 20 years. I left the Statesman two years ago to go freelance, and now I'm writing for a number of publications around the state and the country, and I'm really zeroing in on kind of bigger adventure stuff. Um, It's getting bigger and bigger, so I I just love being outside. It's what I do. (laughs) Fantastic. So you just kind of mentioned something, and that was... Uh, the big trips. And so I'm seeing a lot more in your social media feeds about these big trips and these big uh, destination trips that you're doing. And we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into that in just a moment. But I also want to uh, sort of emphasize the fact that when you're not on a big trip, it's it's about the daily commitment to activity oh, yeah, and yeah, play yeah. and adventure. Yeah. So talk a little yeah. bit about that, because it's very much part of your DNA. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was I was telling my husband just the other day. In the last four days, Friday, I I had worked hard Monday through Thursday, um, and I like to talk about activity and outdoor adventure in my social media. So 
I decided to take the day off sort of and go paddling on the San Marcos River because I love to paddle. I, last year, I did the Texas Water Safari, which is a crazy paddling race from San Marcos to the coast. Um, so Friday, I got out on the water. Saturday, uh, we went water skiing. They finally opened the boat ramp. So my husband and I love to water ski. So I started my day with that. Sunday, we went to Blanco State Park so I could swim and he could paddleboard. Yesterday morning, we water skied. This morning, I just got back from swim practice. Like, the point is, like, I don't feel right unless I go out and do something. And I think the most important part of your day, really, for me, it happens usually in the morning. Is like, I want to get out and do something. I had a swim coach that once told me, never call it a workout because it's not work. It's the best part of your day. And for me, that has always been true. Like, I have got to get outside and move because it makes me feel alive and it's fun. It's like playing all the time. And that's what I want to do is I want to play for a living. So I do. <laughs> that's fantastic. Now you just mentioned uh, Chris. So uh, tell us a little bit about your sidekick. Yeah. So Chris is my husband. He's Cajun and uh, we've been married for 21 years, I think. Um, and he actually has started swimming in the last, seven or eight years. He never was a swimmer. He was always a, he played tennis and basketball, but now he likes a lot of the same things that I do. So we can't always adventure with me, but he does a lot of the stuff that I do. Like we just got back from a, a socially distant camper van tour of Colorado. So we, we uh, jumped in a camper van and just drove all over the place and hiked and rested and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and I was going to mention the fact that, you know, because you're putting so much content out continuously, uh, it's it's clear that he's there a good amount of the time uh, as not yeah. only part Sherpa, but also photographer <laughs> and documentarian. And, Band-Aid, uh, Band-Aid put her on her, sunscreen put her on her. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and 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 fellow adventurer, because, you know, it's sure. the, the post that I saw. Uh, from your trip in Colorado, and and by the way, that's such a beautiful area of Colorado down in the Buena Vista area, and, and yeah. all that. You know, a, a few of the photos were uh, you know out on the river and rafting. So, talk a yeah. little bit about that particular trip. Uh, was it your sure. first cap- camper van trip? Um, we are big backpackers, so typically we did the John Muir Trail a couple of years ago, and typically we're pitching tents, but. I have done a couple of stories for magazines in the last couple of years about different forms of camping that people are interested in. Like I, one time I dragged a little trailer around that had kind of a a tent on a platform. And another time I rented an old West VW Westphalia van. And there's so much interest in van life right now that we decided we would try it and actually freaking loved it. So we rented a camper van, um, it was a, a a Dodge Promaster 1500 that had been rigged up with a little miniature refrigerator and a little stovetop, and it had a, a bed that slept two people. And uh, since there's so many other people that are interested in that, we kind of wondered what it would be like. And now that travel has shifted so much with the pandemic, we figured this would be a great time to try it. So we went around Colorado. We started in Denver and kind of made a big loop uh, over to Buena Vista and the Western Slope, Paonia, and then came back through Redstone, Carbondale, and then over to Twin Lakes and back to Denver. And we did a lot of, um, along the way, we we stayed a couple of nights in campgrounds. We stayed a couple of nights in a, a fruit orchard, which was kind of a fun, different thing to do. We camped beneath between rows of pink lady and golden delicious apples. <laughs> and then um, we did some dispersed camping, which I am a huge fan of. And that essentially means camping on public land outside of a designated campground. It's legal. And, you know, Colorado has so much more public land than Texas does. I think it's like 36 or 37 percent public land. And in a lot of that land, you can just drive your camper up to places, um, you know, park your rig and and spend the night. It's fantastic. And you aren't near a lot of other people. So it's safe right now. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, it was neat to uh, following along vicariously, you know, through that. And it seems like uh, uh, in the state that we're in, we, you mentioned the the coronavirus and the pandemic and, and the fact that uh, uh, Texas and, you know, our area has been hit particularly hard. Uh, Laura and I are just pretty much been sheltering in place ever since March. Uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about um, the fun little thing that you guys did during the height of the lockdown, oh. the early <laughs> lockdown, because that was so fun. Oh, my gosh. It, it was kind of weird. I don't know how this happened, but the very first day that the governor um, essentially put lockdown on uh, in Texas, I, it was early, it was maybe mid-March, I can't remember. Anyway, for whatever reason, that first day, I only thought it would last, I think a lot of us only thought it would last maybe a month or so. And I thought, well, heck, I am going to put on a fancy dress and high heeled shoes. And Chris is going to make me a cocktail. And I'm just going to sort of flip off the virus in my own way. So I put on my outfit, I went out in the street in front of our house and twirled. And Chris took a picture of me. And then so it developed into this whole thing where every day, at the end of the day, I would put on a different fancy dress. Chris would make me a cocktail and I would go stand in the street and twirl. So my dress flared out. So it got to be this whole thing and people started following it on social media. And um, I did it until, I, I guess it was sometime in May. I can't remember exactly when it ended, but whenever they first eased the restrictions on the lockdown. Um, so I, I have a series of like, I don't know how many, maybe 45 or 60 pictures of me twirling with a cocktail in the street in the dress. And the funny thing about it was um, the New York Times picked it up. <laughs> so, so the New York Times heard about it um, and they can't, they sent a photographer and a reporter interviewed me. So then it became this even bigger deal. So I have this whole collection of photos. I, I keep thinking I need to do something with it, but the whole point of it was for me was like, um, you know, I think I just felt better making myself fancy at the end of the day. And I am not a fancy person. Trust me. I'm usually running around in gym shorts or a swimsuit. So it, it was just kind of my way of flipping off the situation, I guess, <laughs> making the best of it. I like to think of myself as an optimist. So trying to have a little fun. Yeah, and I think that's probably what uh, many of your friends and, and followers on social media just kind of, you know, were drawn to is that it was so out of character. I mean, here you are <laughs> right. dressing up, no. uh, you know, at, at different levels. And what was neat is even the yeah. drink that you would have had a different oh, theme yeah, yeah, yeah. to it. And and so it was just, yeah. it was fun. It, it actually, it, people, yeah. I, I know people were, were commenting is that they oh, were yeah. looking forward great. to w w yeah. what's the next dress, what's the next drink. Yeah. And I, and I always try to put a little story with it because there was always like half the clothes were loaned to me by people or given to me or hand-me-down stuff. So people thought that I had this amazing closet full of fancy dresses, which I don't. I mean, most of them were, were not really mine. Um, and on the very last day, um, I, I had a, my wedding dress in a box in my closet. And actually I wasn't even a hundred percent sure that it was my wedding dress. Cause after I got married 20 years ago, took it to the dry cleaner, they boxed it up and put it in shrink wrap. And I couldn't, there was no way to see inside the box. So I, they told me it was my wedding dress, but on the last day of the lockdown, I opened that up and put on my wedding dress and twirled in the street. It was fun. Fantastic. That, yeah. And, and thank you for, for doing that. Uh, yeah. it, it was, it was such a neat thing to, to follow along with. And, uh, Let's shift gears a little bit because something is super, super exciting just happened. You took delivery of a very wow. special box wow. of books. What was that all yeah. about? Yeah. So I can't believe it finally happened. I have my first book coming out. Um, and on Saturday, th this book has been a long time coming. I, I have written, a, it's called my story is all true, but it's actually not my stories. I wrote about J. David Bamberger and Bamberger is famous because he's the person or one of the people that started Church's Fried Chicken. 
Um, he's 92 years old now, but I didn't write about him because of his chicken business. Basically, he when he was about 50, he he got out of the chicken business. He took the the fortune that he had earned, and he um, sought out what he perceived to be the most worn out, abused piece of land in the Texas Hill Country. So he bought a ranch near Johnson City, and over the next 60 years, took out the invasive species, uh, nurtured the land, treated it right. The water came back. All these animals came back. And now he's an icon in Texas and really across the country for what he does to um, for his land conservation techniques. Um, and so he's also a great storyteller. And I met him maybe 12 years ago when I was writing a story about him for the Austin American Statesman. He had won an award, a conservation award. So I went out to visit with him. Um, and we just hit it off. He's a great storyteller and all his stories are slightly embellished. So you never exactly know exactly what's true, but he's pretty good. Um, so we got to become friends and I would go out to his ranch and we would uh, dig for projectile points. He's got an area of his ranch where every time you go over there and dig, you'll pull out, you know, a beautiful spear point of some sort. Um, and that was just the stuff of dreams to me. I always leave everything I find there. Um, but he started telling me these stories about his childhood and about what it was like uh, starting Church's Fried Chicken. And he actually started out as a door-to-door vacuum cleaner salesman. Then he became the church's guy. Uh, he grew up real poor. So he has a great personal story, but he's just a wonderful storyteller. So I, my book just came out on Texas A&M University Press. And it's the story of my friendship with David um, with his stories kind of inset among that. It's my very first bar- book and it was, you know, torture to write a book. I had no idea how hard that would be. And I was trying to write it while I was working full time at the Statesman. So uh, it took a long time, but I got it in my hands. And um, man, that was a great feeling. I can't believe I actually have a book. I'm I'm real sad, actually, because I... I wanted to, you know, in my dreams, I was going to have a big book signing party and that can't happen. (laughs) I think I'm going to do a drive-by book signing instead, but, you know, it's done. So relieved. So I was out there uh, just Sunday uh, sharing some of the, getting David to sign a few copies of the book for me so I can sell them. So. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And so it's a uh, Texas A&M uh, University Press. And yes. uh, again, the the full title of it is My Story is All True, J. David Bamberger on life as an entrepreneur and a conservationist. Um, I know yes. locally here in Austin, for, for those of our, our viewers and listeners that are in the Austin area, uh, book people will probably have a few copies yes. of, available yes. uh, out there. And yes. uh but people will so. have them. Barnes and Noble will have them. Um, it's available on Amazon. Or if you contact me directly, I'll get you a deal on it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So you 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 addressed one of the questions that I had, which was that that transition from being a journalist and having more short form stuff to 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 yeah. that transition of being an author. Uh, talk a little bit more about that process, and and you address the fact that in the at least in the first part of it, you were still employed at the at the newspaper. Yeah, so I was at the Austin American Statesman for 21 years, you know, and I'm used to turning around a story in a in a few hours or a couple of days at the most, um, and stories that were relatively short, you know, 25 to 50 inches long. That's newspaper talk. I don't know how many words that is, but I I am shifting to write more magazine stuff, which is longer format, and I really love that because it gives me a chance to get more um, more in depth with what I'm writing about. I've been doing a lot of writing for Texas Monthly Magazine, um, Texas Highways, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Real Simple, um, just an assortment of magazines that allow me to to. I don't have to be so short and concise. It's a, diff- a little bit of a different style. Um, and it's a learning curve for me too. But I'm, I'm writing, my, my real dream is to, to cover big time adventure. And I'm sort of easing my way into that. I've, I've been doing more stuff like I'll, I'll take a week long canoe trip out in West Texas and write about the adventure of that. 
um, a few, uh, a month or two ago, I was chasing some Austin paddlers who paddled from the tip of Texas all the way to the Louisiana border. So I was on land, you know, I wasn't paddling along with them because I'm not that skilled. Um, but I was meeting them and camping with them along the way and then writing their story as it unfolded. And that's the same group of paddlers who plan to paddle the Northwest Passage next summer. It was supposed to be this summer, but it got delayed because of the virus. So they're targeting next year to, to paddle, to kayak their way all the way across the Northwest Passage. Um, and these are some guys that in 2012 paddled the entire Amazon River. So uh, they've, they've got the chops to do it. And that trip will take them probably 90 days. And so, again, I won't be paddling with them, but I'll be meeting them at points along the way and writing about that adventure. So I'll be hopefully if all goes well, I'll be gone all next summer working on that. So that's the kind of thing I really want to um, sink my teeth in is just big stuff fun, crazy stuff like that. Yeah. And, and to be clear, it's, you know, you're also part support crew. I mean, I, I saw some of the, <laughs> the uh, photography that you, you had out there. I mean, there was yeah. all sorts of drama, like getting the cars oh, or the yeah. truck stuck oh, and goodness. all that. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> all kinds of funny stuff happened on that trip. And, and to me, that's part of the story. It's like, Things never go exactly as you plan. And that was just a two-week adventure. Uh, and so next summer, we're looking at a, a much longer trip. But, but yeah, I, um, I, I, I got to change a tire in an F-150 pickup truck all by myself in the middle of nowhere, and that made me feel great. <laughs> I got it stuck in the mud and had to get someone to haul me out. A lot, a lot of uh, fun things happened. I, I ruined my cell phone and got a piece of rice stuck in the charging port and there was I mean <laughs> it was pretty fun I love that kind of stuff though it's you know it, it was like every obstacle that was thrown at me I figured out how to get out of it eventually so and I, I you know I'm 56 years old and still learning stuff every day and that's that to me is fun and exciting <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm I'm right behind you. I'm I'm a 1965 baby, so I'm 55 right. And right there with you. Uh, and what's fun about you, uh, Pam, is that y this is this is authentic. This is who you are out on your website. Which, by the way, everybody, um, her website is pamleblancadventures.com. And the the ch the the quote that you have out there that makes me chuckle is, "I'm no stranger to public humiliation." <laughs> Tell us oh, yeah. more about that. That's great. Oh my gosh. I I mean, I will try almost anything and, and I'm not afraid to fail at it because I, I kind of feel like I'm the regular person, right? I'm not, um, I'm a swimmer and I, and I get out and do stuff, but I'm not a great, I'm not an outstanding athlete. I, I'm not middle of the pack person. So I'm, um, I'm not afraid to fail and I fail all the time. I mean, and I'm afraid of heights. I, I have my Achilles heel is is fear of heights, but you know, I've done all sorts of crazy things like run a naked 5k race. I have jumped off a 10 meter platform, which doesn't sound like it's all that high, but it's like, you know, <laughs> it's really high. I've rappelled down a, a high rise building in downtown Austin. I have I, scuba dive with sharks and I've swum around Manhattan Island with a partner and that's a 26 mile swim. Like I'll, I'll start anything. And I, you know, usually, uh, usually I'll be able to finish, but not always. I, one thing that I did and failed miserably at was I was trying to learn how to do a water ski jump. Well, I'm a water skier, but apparently I'm not a water ski jumper because <laughs> I wiped out every time I tried it. But I had a good time trying and wiping out. Yeah, that's that's great. I think I remember the series of photos uh, that you guys were putting out there of of that uh, that period when you were attempting the the oh, water speed. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's and it's great, and and I do see that there's that love of the water, um, and, oh, yeah. and some of your photos that uh, you and and Chris, or you know, your your morning adventures, getting out on the lake yeah. and doing some water skiing, and it's just yeah. absolutely 
you know, yeah. smooth and just yeah. glassy out there. Yeah. So I, and fun. the water to me is just so soothing because I, I feel like when I'm in the water, it's Mother Nature giving me a full body hug. And, and I'll take a, a, you know, I'll swim in the lake or the ocean over a swimming pool with a stripe on the bottom any day. I love swimming in the pool and I love the social interaction of that. And I love having a coach, but to me, I really, during the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of swimming in Lake Austin and a cove in Lake Austin. And to me, that's just so peaceful and, um, you know, it's mental as well as physical for me. And I love that feeling of being out in nature and swimming with trees and the sun rising and all that to me is just the best. I love it. Yeah. And one of the things that we're missing just a ton because we're walking distance to Barton Springs pool is oh. having that not available. It's just, it's so tough. Yeah, I know. That's a special place. I would normally would be swimming there one morning a week, but haven't been able to do that either. So it's been, um, but it, it's a challenge, but we found that we're doing different things. And I, I think you just got to figure out what it is you want to do and um, find a way to do it. I mean, we can still hike. We can still, we've been doing a lot of r bike riding out in the country. I have a gravel bike. So we've been going out to Bastrop or near Palmetto State Park and getting on gravel roads where there's no traffic. So you don't have to worry about cars buzzing by. Um, we've been getting in Lake Austin and swimming and, um, you know, just finding, going hiking, finding different ways to get outside and be active because to me that's I, I go crazy if I stay at home and sit in front of my computer all day I really find that mentally especially during the pandemic um, the best thing I can do for myself is go outside in nature where, where things feel a little bit more normal and paddling is another thing kayaking on the San Marcos River or on the Colorado River is just a really great um safe way to get outside in nature and get exercise, which is all around beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now that you're in a, in a position where you are working for yourself, you're a freelance uh, journalist yeah. and a published author. Now hey. uh, it's even more important to be able to break away, put the work down um, and step yeah. away from that, that urge to produce even more content and just, and yeah. get some adventure in. And I'll, I'll use this as an example. I know that you used to frequently uh, commute by bike to right. Austin Statesman when you were still working there. Right. And um, a big part of what we try to encourage with Active Towns is that transformation of communities into more walkable, bikeable, activity-friendly yeah. places. Uh, talk yeah. a little bit about, you know, that, because that was a, a, a subcategory of, of what you write about from a fitness perspective and encouraging yeah. people to, uh, you know, try to integrate active mobility right. into their lifestyle. Right. For me, um, riding my bike to work, like I love to do exercise that's actually functional. And so I was going, I had to get to work anyway. So I would get on my bike and go to work. And by the time I got there, I had a workout just sort of snuck in accidentally. I didn't have to go to the gym, which, which, nothing against gyms, but for me, that feels a little bit more artificial. Like I want to do something that's real. So I have to get to work. I'm going to hop on my bike. And I had a little adventure every day doing it. Like I, um, I would see different animals. I got to pedal past the Creek. I would see buildings going up around. Um, and I love the idea of incorporating bike riding into just your daily fitness routine or, or using your bike to run errands when you can. Um, I, I ride my bike all the time. You know, I don't even, we have a shed full of bikes in the back, but my bike lives in the living room so I can just roll it out the door real easily. So it's, it's my primary go-to mode of transportation. It's a lot more fun than sitting in a car in traffic. I think I prefer it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You'll you'll get no arguments from me. <laughs> it's like yeah. we we try to uh, you know we're we're close enough that we can I can jump on the bike and uh, ride across the bridge and get to Whole Foods and and that's my yeah. normal weekly trip. So yeah. uh, we try to keep the 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 car. In fact, we were able to downsize. We were lucky enough to be able to downsize from two cars to one uh, when great. we made the move from Hawaii. So it it it's. Yeah, we try to do what we can to do meet most of our daily needs, and we're quite privileged yeah. in being able to do that. Right. Uh, right. You know, by walking and biking, and uh, and just right. trying to have that connection to the outdoors and and yeah. to nature. So, you know, um, really, yeah, I've really noticed a lot more people out on their bikes since the pandemic hit, and also just, we're lucky because we live near Shoal Creek Boulevard. And Shoal Creek has recently put in a new two-way bike lane. And we see so many people out using that bike lane early in the morning. Um, it's really nice to see. I, I'm hoping that a little bit of it sticks, you know, that when things do get more back to normal, I'm hoping that more people will be riding their bikes instead of relying on their vehicles to go everywhere. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. And you're you're referencing a, a critical piece of infrastructure that the city of Austin's uh, Department of Transportation put in. And uh, you've been, you know, actively involved in this and pardon the pun, active yeah. uh, in, in, you know, leading this lifestyle. Talk a little bit about that transition that you've seen over the years, because it's been this gradual yeah. improvement of becoming a more walkable, bikeable environment. Right. Um, I started riding my bike to the Statesman probably 17 or 18 years ago and did it until I left the Statesman two years ago. Um, but I would say early on, there were, there, are, there always have been some people that rode their bikes to work. But with the advent of bike sharing, with the advent of e-bikes, which are electric assist bicycles, you see a lot more people out there doing it. And I think um, if you try it, you realize that it's not as daunting as it may sound. Like, and there's ways to ease into it. Like you don't have to ride both ways to work every day. You can carry, I would carry, I had a little bag that clipped to the back of my bike and I could carry clothes or you can rotate, you know, toggle back and forth where you would ride one way and bike back. And the next day you would bike two and then drive your car back. So there's ways to ease into it. Um, and it's really a wonderful way to get to know your city and to, and to watch it slowly change over the months and years. So, um, and it's not as hard as you think. Uh, I guess the problem in Austin is it gets so damn hot in the summer um, that it's nice to be able to have a place to shower when you get to work if you're working at an office. And at the Austin American Statesman, I had access to a shower facility, so I was able to do that. I would get to work, I would go shower, and then I'd be at my desk. But, um, you know, not everybody has that opportunity, and not everybody has a route to their office that's bike-friendly. But the city has a lot of resources that can help you find out. You know, you may think you can't ride your bike to work, but if you look at some of the city of Austin's bike maps, you may realize that, oh, it might be a, a less direct route. You don't want to be riding your bike down Mopac, but you can still get to your office. So explore that, you know, and it's fun. Like I, I would make little games out of it. I would go a little bit different way home when I could just to mix up the scenery and all. I loved it. I still love it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's the, the city of Austin and many cities around the country are really striving to build out networks of higher comfort networks. Uh, and specifically, right. it's it's not it's not really intended to be for the adventurers. The you know, it's not right. like it's not built for me. You know, I'm comfortable, right. you know, taking the lane and riding anywhere right. and, right. and and am and, and quite confident confident and competent on my bike. It's meant right. to be a comfortable environment for right. individuals who are interested, but concerned for their yes. safety. And maybe this is new to them. And so they're building out safer routes. And in fact, the new bike map that just came out is all based on 
comfort level. And so it, it oh, identifies right. the color routes color. Yeah. based on the comfort level. Yes. Uh, but the one little trick that you could apply to pretty much any city across the country, across North America, is that oftentimes the highest comfort streets are streets that may be parallel to the main routes that might be in quiet residential neighborhoods that right. hopefully have the connectivity to be able to get to uh, destinations. And there are oftentimes uh, very few cars and just a pleasant, maybe even tree-lined environment. So that's right. just a little little hint. Yeah, and it's really cool um, with the Shoal Creek hike and bike, uh, with the new lanes on, the new bike lanes on Shoal Creek, you mentioned that earlier, the people that I'm seeing more and more of out there are not the the people all in their Lycra kit. It's just regular people who are out for a ride or maybe going to the grocery store. They're not going fast. They're just out and they're in uh, the bike lane on Shoal Creek has these plastic poles all along it. So you really do feel separated from traffic. It's It just takes a little bit of the intimidation out of riding your bike. A lot of people don't feel comfortable taking the lane. I'm with you. Like I am so used to it now um, that I, that I know that I, as a cyclist have a right to be there, but um, not everybody feels that way. And and we're also seeing more separated lanes and more bike pathways. And that really uh, is becoming easier to get around downtown Austin and, and central Austin because of that new infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, you 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 hit the nail on the head there, and 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 really, it's what we call an all ages and abilities environment uh, facilities where everyone should feel safe and and welcome, uh, whether that's an eight year old or an eighty year old, and and really feeling like this is an environment where, oh yeah, I. I, I do have a little bit more protection or separation, and that's exactly what we're seeing. You know across the, the the new infrastructure in Austin as well as a, across the country is when those all ages and abilities uh, facilities start to go in, we start seeing more families out there and yeah. uh, the kids are riding and uh, w- we actually see more women riding frequently and more elderly individuals yeah. riding frequently. And because of electric assist, you mentioned electric assist right. earlier, you're seeing uh, people across generations being able to have that little electric assist, that pedal assist, and that yeah. can help, you know, people ride for longer. I mean, yeah, longer. It takes the hills out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of normalizes a little bit with that heat that yeah. you were talking about. Yes, hey, exactly. if you can decrease your exertion level by, you know, 20 to 40 percent, you might actually yeah. show up to your meeting or your uh, ultimate destination and not be completely drenched. So it's, yeah, a, it's pretty and special. And it's a lot easier to park on a bike in downtown Austin if you're going out. You don't have to worry so much about whether or not there'll be a parking space available. Exactly. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, Pam, is there anything that we haven't discussed yet that you want to make sure that we talk about here today? Oh, I could talk all day, John. <laughs> well, what's our next adventure? What's coming up soon? I'm actually leaving um, in a few days. I'm going on a whitewater rafting trip in Idaho. I'm going to be rafting the Salmon River uh, with a group of I'm the only journalist on the group, but I'm going along to write about it for an article. So that will be camping, outdoor camping along the way and rafting during the day. So that's the next one. Yay. That sounds like so much fun. So Where's a good location for for people to follow along with your adventures? Sure. So I have a website, PamLeBlancAdventures.com. But um, to to see what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis, Facebook and Instagram are the best. And I have two sites on Facebook. One is Pamela LeBlanc. And the other one is Pam LeBlanc Adventures. And that's where I'm posting pictures of what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis and then posting my articles regularly. Uh, Instagram, it's at Pam LeBlanc Adventures. And I post just pretty pictures of fun outdoorsy stuff that I'm doing all the time. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, so the final question uh, for you is the same question that I ask uh, and, and pose to 
every uh, Active Towns podcast guest, and that is this. Uh, there may be listeners that are inspired from this conversation that we're having here, and they want to make a difference. They want to make a difference in their life. They want to make a difference in their community. And what advice do you have for them to try to be able to get uh, either transform their community into a more activity friendly place or get more adventure into their lives? What advice do you have for them? Oh, I guess um, my advice would be find something you like to do that you want to do all the time and and make sure it's something that you love to do and it's fun. So you're not trying to force yourself to do something like you. You're not forcing yourself to go to the gym and work out. It's like, you, I have found that swimming is just my release. So I'm going to swim every day, with, you know, no matter what, or riding my bike. And that way you can set an example to other people in your community of a healthy lifestyle. Like if they see you out riding your bike or paddling your kayak down the river, they want they might ask you questions about it and, and you can get someone else interested in this great lifestyle. So spread the word and have fun. That's my advice. I love it. That's fantastic. Pam, it's been such a pleasure catching up with you Aww. today. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. You're welcome. It was really nice talking to you, John. Thank hey. you for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you all so very much for tuning into this episode. I certainly hope you enjoyed the conversation with Pam. Please be sure to check out her new book about J. David Bamberger's life story, her many engaging magazine articles, and her fantastic social media feeds. To facilitate this, I've included all the relevant links in the show notes and on this episode's land page at activetowns.org. A couple of quick reminders before we part ways. Please don't hesitate to drop me a line if you have any feedback, suggestions, or questions. My email is john, that's J-O-H-N, at activetowns, that's plural, dot O-R-G. It's always wonderful to hear from y'all. And if I may ask for one final favor, please help me grow our audience and this movement to create a culture of activity by telling a friend or two about the Active Towns podcast. Thank you. Well, that's all for now. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.